Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for the introductions. And uh, thanks to my uh, co-panellists. It's very kind of you on an August, uh, lovely August evening to be here. And of course, thanks to the audience for <clears throat> making the travels uh, to be here. And uh, really lovely to see you all. And uh, thanks for being here. Um, so look, um, you know, in order to be able to get this discussion going, obviously, uh, quite a few of you won't have read the book pretty reasonably enough. Uh, so it's pretty useful, I think, for me to give you some brief couple of minutes, three minutes, five minutes, just description of what I think the book is about. Um, I mean, in fact, my interest in, in urban matters, when I think about it, is quite long-standing. So in another life, I used to be um, a sociologist interested in sport. In the 1990s, I spent a lot of time uh, hanging around with football fans and uh, hanging around with football hooligans, in fact. So I've been interested in urban warfare in one form or another since the 1990s. Uh, but the origins of this particular book don't really trace back to various nefarious things in Manchester in the 1990s, but, but are much more immediate. Um, I'd finished a book, I did a book on uh, uh, infantry tactics, uh, and then as Jonathan very kindly said, I've just recently, 2018, published a book on, um, on command. And those two books, the issue of urban operations, began to be more and more prevalent. Uh, in the book on infantry tactics, soldiers were increasingly, normal infantry soldiers were increasingly operating in urban areas, in Basra, uh, Baghdad, Fallujah, and in fact in, in uh, villages in Helmand, those became weirdly urbanised operations, even though they were villages. Um, and so the issue of urban warfare started to rise up in my imagination. And then that was confirmed in the work that I did on, on divisional uh, command. And at the same time as I was working on divisional command, Western forces were coming out of Afghanistan and moving into big war, think, rethinking big, the problems of big war. And as they started to think about that, near-peer, peer competition, the issue of genuine high-intensity urban warfare started uh, to become prevalent to them. And I, sitting there as a researcher beside the British Army, started to think, hmm, one needs to have a look at this problem. And the book really is a response to, to that. Now, what do I argue in the book? Basically, the argument, I think, is you know, it's pretty simple in a certain sense. If you look at um, what military uh, professionals were saying and ac academics were saying uh, over the last few years about urban warfare, they, they ascribe it to two reasons. One, demography. In 1960, uh, there's three and a half billion of us on the planet 1.5 of us, 0.5 billion lived in cities. Today, there's 7, 7 billion of us on the planet. 3.5 billion of us live in cities. So demog demographically, the argument is you can't avoid cities because so many humans live in them. And a, a line to this was, look, cities, especially huge megacities, uh, provide the ideal environment in which insurgents can operate against state forces because the complexity of the environment means that advanced state weaponry and technology becomes irrelevant in an urban environment. So therefore, warfare, conflict migrates into the city because of demography and because of uh, as what I would call asymmetry, the asymmetric advantage it gives to insurgents. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. But the other point, and this is one of the central arguments I try to make in the book, is it's also about armies and force sizes, that what you've seen over the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War is an extraordinary contraction of armies of the size of armies. Armies are basically about half to a third to a quarter of the size they were at the end of the Cold War. Why is this important? Because it means they can no longer form fronts out in the field so that they get dragged into the decisive locations in any theatre of operations. Where are those decisive locations of operations? They're inside cities. So also the reduction of force size is really important in explaining this urbanisation of warfare. And this then was the central thesis running through the book because it's not just that the declining numbers of forces mean that urban warfare is highly likely that forces will be dragged into cities to those key bits of terrain. It's because there's so few soldiers actually doing the fighting, the anatomy of the warfare itself has evolved over the last 30 years. And the central claim I make in the book is this. We move into an era which, in a way, is paradoxical. You know, we love the thought of us living in this sort of kind of liquid postmodern era, but actually, warfare has glaciated into hideous, slow, attritional micro sieges 
within the cities and within neighbourhoods themselves. So you see hideous levels of intense fighting for very narrow objectives inside uh, the city. So you get this localisation, this concentration of military violence and force inside cities themselves. But there's a second element to this. Even as the fighting contracts inside neighbourhoods, because of informational technology, the web, internet, social media, you've got this double movement where fighters inside the city, the forces inside the city, are actively looking to co-opt co supporters, audiences, recruits from across what is now an urban archipelago. So if you look at the Battle of Mosul in 2016 to 2017, ISIS were actively looking to recruit and mobilise across a, a, a radicalised um, uh, Islamic communities across the globe. And Shepherds Bush, they recruited uh, Mohammed Amwazi, Jihadi John, and from East London, from Bethnal Green, they effectively recruited Shemima Begum. So they're actually connecting these districts of London with the city of Mosul. And also, of course, they enacted uh, and activated and supported uh, a, an ISIS group out in the Philippines in Marawi at exactly the same time to mount a massive uh, battle of Marawi. So you've got this extraordinary anatomy, this geography that has both condensed and concentrated into these neighbourhoods where the fights occur and then they move on to the next neighbourhood and so the cities get completely destroyed in the process but in this odd way but at the same time um, cities across the urban archipelago are recruited or bits of cities are recruited into this localised fight and that is the central thesis of what I was interested in trying to do. Fantastic, thank you very much. So uh, what we're going to do is get sort of different perspectives from uh, each of the people and then try and pull them back and draw in the audience uh, in a little bit. But Shashank. Thanks, like thanks very much. Um, Tony, congratulations on the book. Um, among the panel, I have the least exposure to military operations and, and military things, and yet I read and understood and enjoyed it. So um, uh, reassurance to anyone who is uh, not a senior officer or a distinguished academic that they can still read and very much enjoy the book uh, as I did. I, reading it, well, first of all, um, what a timely moment to discuss it, because, you know, hours before I arrived, I've been reading about street-by-street -street updates from Herat in western Afghanistan, Ghazni, which each of those illustrating, uh, I think, key concepts from the book. And I hope we get back onto that in an Afghan discussion, because it's so relevant to this conversation. Um, but, but when I was reading it uh, uh, some weeks ago, I thought back 12 years ago, or 13 years ago, I was a graduate student in America, uh, and I logged on to this uh, website, up-and-coming website called Twitter.com, that, that was sort of new and shiny at the time. Uh, and it was mostly used for sharing pictures of your breakfast, um, you know, uh, up stray thoughts and bits of the news. And one afternoon, I think it must have been the afternoon in the US, uh, bits of news started coming in from India, from Mumbai. Uh, and this was the beginnings, of course, of the Mumbai attacks of, of uh, November 2008. And it was, at the time, striking and compelling because, of course, we had become accustomed to a kind of um, a hyperactive news environment even then of constant updates, rolling news that went back much further, of course, you know, the Gulf War and before that. Um, but this was different. This was, uh, these were ground-level accounts from ordinary people who were in Mumbai sharing news of what was happening at the Taj Hotel, at Victoria Terminus and other sites in the city, in all of its confusion and complexity. And this, to me, picked up really the first element of the book, which was the idea of the city as a globalised battlefield. Um, globalised in lots of senses, you've outlined one of them, but certainly in the sense that the information environment of the city was seamlessly connected to someone sitting in the middle of you know, America, yeah, reading, reading Twitter, uh, getting tactical, granular updates of the movement of these things. And I think that's really interesting for several reasons. First of all, it, it illustrates the globalization of the city in a very tangible way. You didn't get, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because, because, because in the book there are precedents for everything, uh, you know, in very clever and interesting ways. You know, I think everything you can trace back to somewhere in Stalingrad. But, <laughs> but you know, I don't think you could get these tactical street-by-street -street updates of, an, of a battle as a civilian, um, uh, you know, in this unfiltered, raw way prior to that point. 
um, other than through some very niche forums, Absolutely. if you were not a, you know, intelligence officer. Yeah. Uh, so that's one. And that's interesting enough because it was part of the information environment. There's a whole chapter on information. It was part of, you know, you could call it part of cognitive maneuver, if you like that sort of language. Um, and it was part of Lashkari Tiber, the, the Islamist group responsible, their propaganda of the deed, broadcasting this attack in real time um, in, in a very effective way. But it was more than that uh, because the real time updates being thus provided not just through Twitter, but also through rolling Indian television news channels that were at this time uh, extremely uh, um, uh, sensational, intense, vivid, uh, and, and, and manifold. There were lots of competing stations on the ground were providing updates. And it wasn't just that this was part of cognitive maneuver of, of Lashkari Tiber. This was part of their actual maneuver on the ground because the information was being fed back. Commanders in Pakistan were picking up the television uh, accounts and relaying them back to the assault team, who were able to thus identify which room hostages were in at the Taj Hotel. So again, the globalization of the city, its interconnectedness, the fact that it was sort of seamlessly bound up with these information networks in a way that previous battlefields haven't been, was not just sort of part of an information battle, it was actually part of the actual physical maneuver on the ground. Uh, it, again, in a way that was um, enabled through communications that a previous, previous terrorist groups didn't have access to, you know, however sophisticated they were, the level of, of international communications, you had, you know, had radio communications and so on, but you didn't have the ability to use voice over IP, uh, which is what they did, to communicate with handlers in Pakistan, organizing a tactical 10-man assault team on the ground. So again, this was uh, uh, another example of how that globalization wasn't just part of the information warfare, it was part of the, the actual warfare. And then you had the tactics themselves which was, of course, um, you know, not unprecedented. I think in the book you talk about Chechen militants in Grozny using similar swarming tactics. But these was a really compelling demonstration of how a relatively small team using swarming tactics distributed, distributed through the city, uh, relatively lightly armed, um, interestingly uh, using um, performance-enhancing drugs, um, but relatively light weapons otherwise, were able to paralyze this megacity in incredibly effective fashion. So that sort of brings us to the question of how does a, how does a 10 man team paralyze an Indian megacity in a country that of course was accustomed to routine Islamist terrorist attacks, uh, having seen many of them in, in Kashmiri cities in previous years. Now, I, I think this, this connects perhaps indirectly, perhaps loosely to the thesis that Tony outlined, which is that as security forces shrink, they don't envelop cities anymore, they are um, enveloped by cities. What was striking in Mumbai 12 years ago was the Indian authorities, this is, you know, security forces that are huge, an army of a, of a million plus, paramilitary forces of, you know, hundreds of thousands, police forces that, you know, swarm across a city, were completely unable to respond. Specialist counterterrorism forces of the sort that, you know, we take for granted in London, partly thanks to the Mumbai experience, because a lot of learning took place, were airlifted in from thousands of miles away in Delhi and uh, uh, faraway states like Haryana. Uh, and even then, they required airlift from India's civilian foreign intelligence agency, who had to provide these planes to get these special forces to Mumbai. Um, and of course, the thesis of the book is that shrinking armies uh, have to fight in a completely different way and are drawn into a city in a completely different way. And I think to some extent that that's true. The Indians were not able to practice counter-terrorism, uh, counter-assault in the way they would have done in other cities because they weren't prepared for that kind of uh, incredibly novel, at the time, urban challenge. So that, I think, is an extreme example of this idea, uh, Tony, that you, you put it in a very vivid sentence, globalised cities defy their, ability, that defy their capacity to dominate them. Uh, and I think, I think I thought about Mumbai a lot as I, as I read the book. Um, now, I sort of a few questions also came to mind, and if I could throw them up for discussion, um, uh, I thought they might be interesting. One of them is um, the role of air power is really interesting. You say air power is ubiquitous, constant, and extremely precise. Of course, as we saw in Mosul, um, you know, precise, precise doesn't always mean sterile or clinical. It can mean very, very messy indeed. But I'm, I'm fascinated by the question of what does urban warfare look like? Because the really vivid, interesting examples we have recently are, of course, the, the examples from Iraq and Syria. What does that look like when air power is missing? in deeply contested 
airspace because of course you know a lot of the conversations we have around the future of warfare around how do how do western armies fight in uh, areas that are much more contested than the ones they were used to where they perhaps don't have air supremacy they don't have constant surveillance of the urban battle space they don't have uh, recourse to this incredibly intricate network of layered uh, uh, layered, segmented airspace in which uh, different aircraft surveillance strike, others are operating at different altitudes um, with, with basically you know, complete impunity over their adversaries. So what does urban warfare look like in that sort of environment against a serious adversary? I think um, there's not much of that, and I'd like to hear more of your views, uh, more of your views on that. Um, the other question I'm really interested in is the conclusion, which is, you point out that rapid maneuver warfare inside a city is essentially now too risky, you say, because of the increasingly intense firepower that can be brought to bear, um, uh, that that has decelerated urban warfare. It slowed it down. You know, we think of warfare, I think, as occurring as warp speed, as sort of hyperspeed. All of the talk, you know, things, things that I write about for my readership of hypersonic weapons, artificial intelligence that can engage uh, rapidly, um, uh, sort of decision loops being sort of sped up you sort of push back at this and you say, no, the sort of increasing firepower available means that in a city, if you maneuver too fast, you get cut off, you get, you get, you get sort of penny packeted up into small pieces, and this is an incredible risk. I'm really interested to hear, particularly have your view, sort of whether you, whether you agree with that conclusion. Uh, I'd find that very interesting. Um, lastly, what sort of forces fight well in cities? I think this is a question I had at the end, because... Thinking about the last year, I've written a lot about the integrated review, the command paper. It's all been about trade-offs, trade-offs between the sort of forces you need for uh, high-intensity conventional warfare. Uh, and every time we, we've, you know, the, the Ministry of Defence doesn't like us writing about trade-offs, they, they don't think they exist. But uh, every time we write about forces optimised for grey zone warfare, sub-conventional warfare, train, advisor, company, assist, um, uh, the big question is, how can you, can you optimise forces for all these things? The answer is, of course you can't. Uh, so I'm interested in your view, which I, which I think isn't discussed very extensively, but what sort of forces do this well? What's the cost? What do you give up? What do you have to sort of trade off? And then finally, I think we should say a few words on Afghanistan, because what's interesting is the dynamics you describe, um, we, we haven't seen lots of them tested, I think, because the, the psychological aspect has been so decisive, right? I've seen, it's incredible to see garrisons, Governors, civilian leadership surrender quickly in Herat uh, because the Taliban, I think, have convinced them that resistance is futile. Some similar dynamics, perhaps, to Mosul uh, 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 five or six years ago. Really sort of depressing and dismaying. Um, but I'm interested in what lessons you're drawing from the last days of, of warfare. So I'll stop there, if that's okay, Super. and throw it on. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Let's move on to Simon, then, shall we? We'll get a different Thanks. look at huh. taking this. Did you say you didn't know much about this when you started? <laughs> well, I've read the book, so oh, there you, you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I've also read the book. It doesn't always follow if you do these talks that you have, because normally you can just read the reviews. But it hasn't been reviewed yet, so I've actually had to read the book. And it is really good. It's a genuinely great book. Um, I, it really genuinely is, so well done. So I, I want to talk about a city um, that is not famed for urban warfare called Sheffield. And um, it's where I'm born. And um, many of you will have been to Sheffield. You've probably gone to Sheffield Midland Station. And when you went there, you probably have now lost completely my script anyway. So I'm off uh, completely already bugging. So anyway, um, you've probably gone straight into the town up to the universities. So you've gone left to Bramall Lane or right to Hillsborough or down to Derbyshire. But you've almost certainly not gone behind you. You haven't crossed the tracks and gone up the hill. There's four um, Victorian... Uh, old streets there from the 1870s, which I remember from my childhood, and they're actually still there because um, uh, my, my mother was a cleaner, and my uh, cleaner, my mother was a musician. Why did I say cleaner? Uh, she's a musician, uh, and uh, so often she'd be out and uh, at night, and my father would be working as well. And I would stay with our cleaner who lived on that street, and it still had all the houses had outside labs and so on. And towering above them was a huge block of flats called the Park Hill Flats, which were built in 1966. Um, no, slightly earlier, 62 to 64, and were a great triumph of urban living. Indeed, they were based on Le, Cub Le Corbusier's um, Habitacity d'Habitation, I think it's called. But as time went by, as these things do, they started to decay. And the Sheffield of, of my youth, uh, which was a very vibrant and very confident city, degenerates into the Sheffield of, of the Full Monty, and so do the, par the Park Hill Flats. And indeed, it's rather telling, I'm going to find a quote here from a BBC programme that was done on the decline and fall of the, of the, of the um, 
Park Hill Flats. And the quote I'm looking for, here we are, yeah. It said, um, it became a social disaster, fostered crime. And indeed, um, the Park Hill was known for its horror stories, tales of muggings galore, and even sniper-style air gun shootings of children in their primary school. Not good at all. It was grade two listed, so it still survives. But um, it had two moments of fame left to it. The first um, was when an urban photographer took a picture of the graffiti, the very great famous graffiti in Sheffield Park Hill. And uh, it was uh, uh, written over one of these kind of streets in the sky, as they were called, these um, uh, rows of, of um, balcony linked together streets, but going up and up towards the sky that were the hallmark of the Park Hill and were much admired. And it said, uh, I love you, Claire Milton, will you marry me? It became a Channel 4 program um, 20, 20 years later, and they tried to find Claire Milton. Had she married him? No, she hadn't, <laughs> sadly. But the Park Hill had one more moment of fame. It had been much admired by urban planners across the world, and in particular in Belfast. And in 1966, an almost perfect replica was built of the Park Hill called the Divis Flats. And um, the Divis Flats, of course, almost as soon as they were built, became f very familiar, indeed almost iconographic, in tales of urban warfare, when the first deaths of the Troubles, the kidnapping and, and disappearance of Jean McConville, and indeed three, four pages are devoted by you to the Divis Flats, because of its architecture was absolutely perfect for urban warfare. Um, the easy escape routes, the multiple sniper points, the ways in which kids could drop petal bombs and stones um, on uh, the, the army, and indeed the sniper was no longer an air rifle, but actually armor light rifles. It was a great defensive and offensive space. Now, it was finally leveled in 1993, but the memory lingered on. And so when in... Um, a filmmaker, Jan Damage, wanted to recreate the Divis in his film 71, which you don't mention. Thank God, there's something I knew you didn't know. I'm sure you do. <laughs> That's right. Where could he go to? Well, the Park Hill still existed. It had been grade two listed, slightly controversially. Well, actually, very controversially. <laughs> but it was grade two listed, and it was still there. And so the four streets and where I spent nights as a kid become most of the urban uh, scenes in Belfast are shot in those four streets. And of course, as the film moves to its climax, it's in the Park Hill Flats where it's all filmed coming up. So it's a great film, actually. It's really very good. So now the architects of the Park Hill and the Divis never thought that they were building something that would be a perfect setting for urban insurgency. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that any architects of um, urban habitation ever think that, actually. No. I don't think so. Um, I, I don't, is it true that Houseman did think that when he created the boulevards, that they would be good for suppressing the next commune. I don't know if that's a myth or not. No, it's, it is, there is, it, it is true. It is true. Yeah. OK. But more likely is the opposite. And uh, if you do listen to Desert Island Disc, available on iPlayer still for another <laughs> nine months, you'll see my favorite city is Vienna. And of course, what's much more likely is um, uh, urban fortifications have been leveled to create uh, spaces like the Ringstrasse in, in Vienna. But even that's had a military uh, uh, use. Pictures of the Ringstrasse in 1934 show the Heimwehr and the Austrian army on their way to what was called, uh, laughingly called, the Australian, Australian, Australian. <laughs> the Austrian Civil War. It didn't last very long, uh, but it was a civil war. And, um, and do, you know, do you know where the which urban dwelling was the uh, big uh, was the centre of the uh, of the Austrian brief Austrian Civil War in 1934? You got me. Okay, it's called the Karl Marxhof which was shelled from the Ringstrasse by the army and Heimwehr. And uh, now that still exists, and it's very famous. It's actually the longest block of urban habitation in the world. And just to end, see if anyone knows this, that also features in a famous film. Anybody know what film was shot in the Karl Marxhof about 20 years ago? No? It's The Night Porter, Charlotte uh, Dirk Burgard, and Charlotte, rather... rather uh, uh, Rather a distasteful film in many ways, actually, but anyway. So that's, that's the story, then, of how urban habitation. And, of course, Sheffield has never had urban warfare, but if it had, it has the perfect setting. <laughs> um, four pages in your book devoted to the Divis. Absolutely. Brilliant. Super. Thank you very much, Sam. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Anthony, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me today. So I first met Anthony in uh, 2018. 
What I'm going to do is I'm just going to dance a little bit back to what led to that meeting, a bit of context with where we are with the British Army and why this book is actually, for me, certainly sitting in the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps that's now begun the task has been the proponents for urban operations thinking and I think on multi-domain operations and multi-domain integration for the land environment is why this book is actually so important and so different from the others. Um, so th there were a series of... Um, Force development events that went on in the British Army called Urban Dawn. There were six. It culminated in Southampton in about um, 2012, something like 2013 or so. And then it then went on to uh, an exercise led by CGS, uh, which was uh, Snick Carter at the time, handing over to Mark Carlton Smith. Neither of them attended, but it was a deployment of all one stars and above in the British Army to Berlin. There's a number in the audience here that attended that, and uh, we also took with us uh, other people from other services and nationalities. The aim of that was to quantify what the gap was in where we needed to be in fighting in an urban environment. And we chose Berlin because it's the location was near Schnoggersburg, which is the largest urban operations training center run by the German military uh, just outside of Magdeburg. And it was a great week. But the problem is when you have a whole load of army officers in an urban canyon in the center of Berlin, you all start talking about the same thing, which is how to get through that second floor window. And where this book is so different is it elevates you beyond the squad member, beyond the brigades, up into this sort of core level, this intercomponent of how a military does urban warfare, not urban tactics. Now, a lot of the book talks about tactics, and you've heard a lot of what previous presenters have spoken about, about small bands of determined men, how 10 people can actually hold down Mumbai. There is a lot of that in there, but there's also about how to harness other non-military levers that can help in the totality of urban warfare. There's only really four other publications that spring to mind that, that tries to help, certainly someone from my background, in understanding how to operate at a command level. You've got Michael Evans, he talks about strategy and lethal genes, about how to operate at the higher operational level in urban environment. You've got the environment, Stephen Graham talks about vertical, each vertical and horizontal surface that there is within a mega city, from subsurface to surface, right the way up to sky, dominated by UAVs and, and air power. And then at the lower tactical level, you have concrete held by Louis DiMarco. Now, all those uh, literature are actually mentioned in the book, and what Anthony has done a wonderful job is synthesizing all this together and throwing up a number of implications. But to me, it doesn't quite scratch the itch, because a lot of the implications in structures, in forces, in how you train forces and proxies, are all to do with fighting a non-state actor and predominantly an insurgent, which is where our experience is of the last decade. Within the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, we're supposed to be the core war fighting at readiness organization. Now that sees us liberating, reclaiming a city on NATO turf against a state adversary. And how that is done is probably different to how you're actually gonna tackle going into a large urban area that is full of insurgents, of which the population and the audiences within that city may or may not be aligned with it. Whereas clearly if it's a NATO and it's a reclamation of a city, then they're already on your side. And what worries me is when people talk about doing urban operations, is they think back, and having just come back from Baghdad and I went around Mosul, is that you destroy a city to save it. And I don't think politically within NATO, if we did reclamation of a major municipal centre, that they would allow us to destroy it in order to save it. There's got to be a different way in which you fight and you operate. And Anthony talks about it with the, in this archipelago. If you imagine a mega city as an ocean, well, when the, the southern fleet under MacArthur in the Second World War, he just went to certain islands before then seizing Japan. You don't have to dominate the entire ocean. And I would argue it's probably the same in a mega city. It's just trying to take out the different bits of cancer at different times with different technology, with different techniques, with different style of forces or non-military forces. But then no one ever tells you what you are to do with that city. Are you trying to seize it, to control it, to own it? And until you can actually understand what effect it is that you want to achieve, then you can then design the style of forces. Now, the book is really good. It's, it's structured. When I talk multi-domain operations, it's the land, the sea, the air. It's the new ones of space and cyber. There's a chapter on each talking about the utility and implications of using that particular platform, be it air weapons, or ground-based munitions, right the way through to information, and particularly drawn, David Patrick Harris was um, war in 140 characters or so. Um, and that's good, because it tries to synthesize all that together. 
what it also talks about is the different forces. He's quite right. You know, no Western army is now big enough to take a major city. But you need to leverage other forces. And part of the integrated review in the defense papers is trying to leverage proxies. You have proxies, you have partners, you have independence. And again, in Baghdad, you know, we were dealing with all those three. Sometimes their political objectives were aligned with us. Sometimes they're not. You know, we, we used... We didn't collaborate or coordinate with, but you had Iranian-line militia groups going up against ISIS, just as much as the Iraqi army, the counterterrorism service, or the Syrian Democratic Force in northeast Syria. And you're trying to use all these different types of capabilities to try and take out an insurgent that otherwise would take a foothold in a major municipal center. And, and there is still a need for position weapons, but also there is a time, as there was at the back end of March, where over 4,000 tons were dropped on the Hamrin Mountains to try and cease an entire rat run, almost urban but subterranean cave dwellings that were used by ISIS to export their violence across northeastern Iraq and the Levant. So I would say the book is absolutely fantastic. It's structured absolutely the right way. It's about cities, it's about strategy, and it's about the forces that you need to operate within them. But that's from an insurgent non-state actor perspective. And it's how you then try and harness everything else to go after a state actor in a NATO city where you are actually trying to take it back from an adversary. Maybe a, a, a different chapter in itself. That's all. Thanks. Super. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you all uh, on the panel. Um, I was going to say some other nonsense, but it's not really very interesting. So <laughs> apart from one thing that comes out, because I think it comes out of, of all the things that people have said here, is that one of the things that this book had me doing was wondering whether our definitions of war actually are terribly helpful and, and full and, and complete and very helpful in this situation or in some of these situations, you know. Is Operation Motorman in Belfast a war? Is suppressing the terrorists in Mumbai a war? Is it putting down boys with air guns in Park Hill Flats or, or Armalites in Divis Flats? You know, is that really a war? And, and how much, how do we calibrate, to Kevin's point, how do we calibrate that the destructiveness and the violence that we are prepared to use to achieve whatever the mission is. By which I mean, in these kind of, in the kind of wars that are in this book, and, the, and one thing I would really commend it for is the width and breadth of the historical case studies that Tony uh, draws in, all the way from, you know, Stalin, actually from Jericho, I think, all the way through to Stalin, and Stalingrad uh, and more recently. But, but, but they, are, they are, as Kevin said, mainly recent examples from recent wars, which are primarily wars about legitimacy yeah. and about making people feel safe. And the, peop the, 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 the armed force which manages to make the people feel safest, and this comes back to the Afghanistan points that, that Shashank was talking about earlier, are, are the ones who will tend to win. And, and so one of the reasons that this fighting is going on in cities, perhaps, is because that's where the people are that you need to win over. Uh, and... But, of course, that kind of war is very different from a, excuse the crudity, balls out Soviets versus Nazis in the ruins of Stalingrad, where, frankly, the people are co a complete irrelevance. The buildings are literally just getting in the way, and the only thing you do is flatten the whole bloody lot, anyone who happens to be hiding in the cellars underneath them, and you don't care. So, so how one sort of positions war and, and, and the way that we build forces and calibrate the, the amount of violence that we think is legitimate in that kind of war, as opposed to the wars for legitimacy that we've seen recently. That was the thing that had me yeah. Yeah. thinking really hard. And, and, and just the final point on that, which is that you know, we, we tend to think about war as uh, you know, the use of force to persuade an enemy to do her will. Very Klaus Witzian, very lim you have limited wars, you have unlimited wars, and there's nothing in between, really. And and actually, that's not, of course, the experience of anyone who's caught up in any of these yep. wars. The, the dominant image of urban warfare, I'm sure, for people of my generation, is, is those photographs or the, the film of school kids ducking through the ruins in Sarajevo on the way back from school, ducking, you know, trying to avoid the snipers and this sort of stuff. It, this is a very visceral existential conflict for them, even if it looks like a limited conflict for the peacekeepers that are trying to, 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 to get established. And so, so maybe we need to think about war in a rather different way. That was my...
that's my only interesting thought. No, very interesting thought. So Thanks. Adam. Would you like why, me to... Why don't you sort well, of have a bit of a look, go at some look, of these I things? I mean, it's, it's not easy to, to respond to, you know, the sort of richness <laughs> of what I've just heard, but let, let me just try and make a... Make a, 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 a book. A, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. write another book. Another just, book. just, just, uh, yeah, I'll just... Uh, it won't take me too long. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, if you... You know, I'll come to Simon's point about architecture right at the end, but, I mean, it, 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 you know, Jonathan Shashanks and, 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 and Kevin's point are, you know, really in, looking at this issue of, you know, what kind of urban warfare have we seen? What kind of urban warfare will we see? Are the inferences I've drawn from a set of empirical examples over the last 20 years adequate to the phenomenon itself and the phenomenon as we go forward to the future? So let me try and answer that. So in terms of your sort of more philosophical answer, yeah, I mean, look... Um, you know, what is warfare? Yeah, it's use of violence for political ends, organised use of violence for political ends. So therefore, when we're talking about warfare, immediately we've got a spectrum from pretty low levels of violence, where I would definitely put organised crime somewhere there, and terrorism, and the Mumbai terrorism, really the level of violence, it was very, it was short, but incredibly intense for the period. So you would put that there. And then gradually you move up, and at the furthest end, you've got full-on interstate war, Stalingrad, and what Western forces are thinking they're preparing for uh, against Russia or against China now. And, and, of course, what do we not have in my example set for this book? Well, thank God we've got no examples of full-on interstate urban warfare. So where was my cursor for this book? My cursor was somewhere around... You know, they were generally civil wars... But at the battle level, at the, ba at the operational level, really quite intense. So the cursor was about here. Now, I would say, absolutely, that doesn't mean that, you know, that sort of, sort of philosophically, um, it's warfare, but it's of a particular characteristic. Now, it's important not to essentialise the set of empirical examples I've had. Over the last 20 years, we've seen a particular kind of, kind of urban battle which has a strong family resemblance. Civil war, lots of non-state actors, militias operating in the local area which, they've all, that which they already own. One size has air power, the, in, the insurgents do not. So you've got a characteristic which I completely accept is an empirically biased characteristic. But, of course, that's what I had to analyse at this particular point. Now, but what you've pointed out, all, you know, all of you, is the seam in the book is right. OK, the, sa the empirical sample is, def is, 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 is limited, but since philosophically warfare has this wider spectrum, how do we apply that sample set to the others? And particularly, in all three of you, is how do you apply interstate warfare, sorry, intrastate civil war, which is the prime examples I've used, because they're the they're the ones that have existed. The only, the interstate wars that, you know, Iraq invasion was three weeks against a state force that was totally irrelevant, effectively. So there's very few. So how do you extrapolate from that data set to this really important question of, OK, what's an interstate war in a city going to look like? And is it going to actually happen? Well, I think, it's, I think it's highly probable it would happen. On the basis, very carefully, the extrapolation I would make um, that, that you, 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 you talk to, Shashank, um, would be that actually um, you would have two sides competing with air power, um, with lots of artillery, lots of firepower. And so actually, for me, my, my inference is actually warfare would glaciate even further mm. and become even more attritional. And indeed, I think, here's my prediction. I didn't put it into the, into the book. I've spoken about it, but I wasn't confident enough to put it into the book as a projection forward. I did do some projecting at the end. But what I think an interstate warfare would actually look like would be um, state forces quite far apart from each other quite a long time. You know, air, lots of air power, lots of long-range artillery in their own citadels inside cities apart from each other. And then assaults into cities and then hideous attritional battles of high, of high intensity, lots of firepower within. So, you know, to be honest, my vision of future interstate warfare would be pretty bleak at the urban level. Uh, and, I think that, and I think that's what you've got to prepare for. I mean, I think this is Kevin's job is, 
that, that's the kind of fight you've got to prepare for. And this is where we've got to be really ex careful with examples like Mumbai. Mm. Terrorists can still infiltrate. The global city, because it's so large, because it's so diasporic, it provides an incredibly rich environment for the opportunist terrorist. But you've got to be careful extrapolating that to what an interstate warfare, the kinds of freedom that suicide terrorists pumped up on drugs knowing they're going to die will do, and what an interstate a state force will do, I think, is, is, um, is a different one. But, but this, is the, this, is the, you know, this is like being before the First World War. Nobody knows what... You know, you can make these projections, but nobody quite knows, ah, it's... You know, very few people writing, and there was a few, but very few people writing in 1910, 1912 are saying, right, it's going to be trench warfare. But that's what, that would, on the extract, that very difficult extrapolation, that's where I would be. And it's a pretty depressing one. The other extrapolation is, ah, nuclear exchange, mass bombing, I, I, I would say. Now, this leads just to Simon's point about architecture. Can I make one quick yeah, interjection? Yeah, of course you can. Which yeah, is yeah, just yeah, yeah. That, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that the most tangible example of that I can think of is going to somewhere like Taipei, yeah. where you can Completely. see the architecture of urban warfare, not, not in that sense, but in the sense of fortified bridges, armour yeah. concealed within the urban infrastructure, sometimes visibly so, um, prepared for a very real mm. interstate war. Now, we don't, know what, we don't know how long they would survive, yeah. how they might manoeuvre, whether they could manoeuvre, how they would be used. We don't know any of that. That's all conjecture. But it's latent. It's there. It's the most tangible aspect of it. Of course, there aren't. Thank, thank God, there aren't many places that are like that where you feel whether it's so, uh, you know, sort of latent yep. and sort of visible. But, but I mean, in fact, you, you just said exactly what I, what I was going to come to say. Exactly that. The question now is, okay, if that's the future, if you, I mean, Simon, you brought up this, you know, these lovely examples of the history of architecture, which is not divisible from the history of military architecture. So all the great architects, in, actually until the 20th century, were also great military architects mm -hmm. as well. Um, so the question then is, right, okay, if that's the kind of state, if that's the, the future state warfare, just like architects, you know, Michelangelo, um, Leonardo were actually contributing to the re-fortification of Europe in the uh, early 16th century. They, they made designs for the Tres Italiens, yeah. etc. If that's the future, well, we've all. What would what would a what would a defended city in Estonia actually look like? And the Taipei example, I think, is a very very interesting one. And the other question is, what would be the architecture like the Divis Flats in the Falls Road? What would be the worst kind of thing to build? Answer: Ah. Postmodern massive towers yes. made of glass and steel would be the worst thing you could possibly build, and they don't work without air conditioning. I mean, I, so we, we end up in, exactly. It's, but it's but like the divis yeah. fat, yeah. it sells or yeah. sells for a period. Yeah. So that 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 would be. But I mean, those are conjectures, um, which I kind of intimated towards the end of the book, but which I I was you know I cowardly sort of. Sidestep. So you're right to you're right to get me on them. Well, what I might do is just sort of come back to the panelists for a minute, and in the meantime, we've got about only got about ten minutes left. So if anyone's got questions that they would like to ask, please think about them, and uh, we'll come to you in a minute. Anyone want to, to well, come back? To say the end of your book is in fact quite depressing. Yes, yeah, very depressing. <laughs> the <laughs> final chapter is called yeah. Armageddon, and the yeah. final <laughs> subtitle is Nuclear Holocaust. Yeah. So I probably <laughs> stop at chapter fourteen. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he offers uh, three separate outcomes. One is war in a megacity. We've already spoken about that. A, um, another one's an automated war, which is just the mass exploitation of a smart city to try and leverage that militarily using smart technologies and then mass air attack, carpet bomb the place into a nuclear exchange. Um, <laughs> and even though he makes those three different observations, he goes back to the default, which is slow, time-consuming, very uh, humanistic, which is Mosul. It takes time over time, and, and I'm probably there with you, and I think that that's probably the, the biggest way to... The more likely scenario is the Belfast scenario, as you were just saying, that if you're defending or retaking NATO cities, very little damage that you can cause. In the end, the Divis Flats were blown up, but not by the army, but by Belfast City Council, yeah. Yeah. who do have the power to blow it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah.